Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Community Center, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It's a beautiful fall day, and so we know uh, that, that uh, it's taken a lot to pull you away from that, but hopefully we'll have an informative session. This is one of our standing series of Sunday meetings where we will provide an update on the city, uh, the, the school, uh, George Mason High School design process, as well as the West Falls Church economic development process. Um, we have Mayor Tarter here. Uh, Mayor, would you like to come forward and just say a, a welcoming remark or two? Sure. I not a whole lot more to say. I do thank you all for coming out. And um, this is, as you know, a collaborative process, an iterative process that's been going on for many months, if not years. And um, it's really important to have people come out and express their opinions and have a give and take and a dialogue. So I really do appreciate that. Um, so that's about all I got to say. You know, stay tuned. We're making a lot of progress. Um, and uh, there's a long way to go, but we've really come a long way so far. So again, thanks for coming out. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor Tarter. And well, I, let's I, introduce our folks from City Council. So, uh, well. so I'll do that, and then I'll turn the mic, where, uh, mic over to Peter, who will introduce the school board members. And just in terms of our organization today, uh, we'll start first with an update on the school design, and then uh, at the end, uh, I'll take just a few minutes for an update on the economic development piece. Uh, which, by the way, is a very similar update to the one we had about a month ago. Uh, we uh, anticipate that we'll have more to announce on that in the month of November. Uh, before we get started, um, if I could just recognize uh, Councilmember Dave Snyder uh, here, uh, Councilmember Phil Duncan, who is here, our Vice Mayor Mary Beth Connolly is here, and uh, Councilmember Letty Hardy. Uh, so uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, Dr. Noonan. Good You've already got a mic. I actually got a little walk around mic here too. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as Mr. Shields said, today is an opportunity for us to kind of share some progress. I will say that um, my update from the school compared to uh, the last few progress meetings we've had is not going to be as significant as we anticipated for this October meeting, and there's a reason for that, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a bit, but we do have some updates to share. Um, I want to take just a second to welcome some of the school board members that are here. Um, Walter Payton, sweetness himself back there, and his bears here, Lawrence Webb. Uh, I had no idea you were such a big fan. I love it. Uh, all right. Go Bears! <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Webb, for being here. Greg Anderson, school board member, Shannon Litton. Shannon, I saw where. Oh, there you are. All right, Shannon is here, and I think uh, that's everybody from the school board. But thank you all very much for, uh, again, your presence here today. Um, my, uh, my comments today, I think, like Mr. Shields, may be a little bit shorter than they have been in the past, um, because we are still, we're sort of in the, on the school side, in the vernacular of the architects in Brailsford and Dunleavy, uh, we are heads down, and the reason that we're heads down is because we are working hard to sort of work through the final schematic design uh, before we get to um, full DDs, which is the, the design development, um, which is a little bit further into the process. And before I go into um, where we are in the process, I do want to sort of describe the distinction between um, what are commonly known in, in the world now, in my world anyway, as SDs versus DDs. So schematic design versus development design, design development. Um, and the, it was presented to me the other day and it made a lot of sense to me. And it was, while we're in SDs or schematic design, we're sort of in the geometry phase of the process, meaning how do we make everything fit? So when we get everything to fit, then we get into um, where things are going to fit, what are the adjacencies, where should things be placed. But the final design development isn't really done until um, we get into the next several months. So really, this is sort of a fitting of programs, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But I, I do want to sort of try to, um, not mansplain here as much as I do at my own house, I think, but just try to describe the difference between schematic design and design development, because we really are sort of just in schematic design. So um, just as a reminder, this is the timeline that we've shared with everybody along the way. Um, November 30, um, of 2017, we had our RFPs. We got into design input, conceptual design process selection, uh, detailed design process and construction. So it looks like um, if you follow this chart along, like we're really close to construction. 
We're not. <laughs> we're, we're pretty far away from construction. There's a lot that happens between the end of this line and construction, but we have made some pretty significant progress from this time last year to where we are today. And I, I, I congratulate and applaud the community that's here for one, your support, but also being able to um, really uh, have the, the wherewithal and, and the, the momentum to really get us to a place. Because um, I think about you know election time last year, we were trying to get a bond passed and how far we've come in just that year. So that's about where we are in this process in, uh, before we get to detailed design. So if you dig a little bit deeper, sort of under that top line. This is kind of where we are. We're in schematic design. So 2018, August through October, uh, we've done a lot of community engagement, staff engagement. We're continuing to refine our schematic design to make sure that the geometry is right, to make sure things are fitting where they fit. We're looking at adjacencies, what should be next to each other, what shouldn't be next to each other, and the like. And then in November, we're going to get to design development. And when we get into design development, the things that we really start Can I interrupt for a sec? Of course. So I got a note from someone watching online that they couldn't hear you. So let me give you this. OK. Let me take that. All righty. Sorry about that. Thank you. Technical. Sure. A little tec technical difficulty there. Um, so when we get into design development, um, that's when we really get into the details of the design, right? So one of the things um, that has been helpful to me is to think about, you know, this um, SD or schematic design is like, what's the br blueprint of your house going to look like? And then the detailed design is, okay, what kind of refrigerators, what kind of seating, what kind of uh, placement of desks, where are things going to fit, um, where do chemistry hoods go, where do t tabletops go, and the like. And that's really what we get into when we get into detailed design. So if you're interested in knowing, like, um, how many chairs or seats are going to fit into this room, schematic design isn't really the place to do it. What, uh, what we are doing is we're building boxes that are big enough or designing boxes that are big enough to accommodate up to the number of um, seats that we need to have. So once we get into the detailed design phase in November, that will work through until the February time frame, February, March time frame. And at that point, there's some other things that are going to kind of be happening. Um, we're going to go forward with our documents um, and have those uh, permitted. Um, there's also going to be more construction documents being drawn and then ultimately permitted uh, for submission. And then as we get into the March and July time frame, we're also going to get into the GMP process, which is the greatest maximum price process that we will be working with um, Gilbane, Stantec, and Quinn Evans on so that when we do get to um, the point where we're ready to break ground in June of 2019, um, we will know at that point how much this building is going to cost and what we're going to pay for it. Um, and then if you go on to the website at George Mason High School, you'll see there's a countdown clock and you can see exact, exactly how many days, how many minutes, and how many seconds until we actually break ground. So we are looking at June 14th, uh, 2019 at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So um, come on by and, and we'll see you then. But that gives you a sense of kind of where we are. Um, so if you follow this, this is, this is where we are in sort of the, the deeper dive of what happens between 2018 now and when we actually break ground next summer. So a couple of things that I want to point out um, today that, that may be useful to you is a place that you can go for information. Um, Gilbane, Stantec, and Quinn Evans, um, along with Brailsford, Dunleavy, and the school system, uh, and some of you may have seen this, are publishing monthly reports on our websites. Uh, and one of the nice things about this monthly report is there are some pieces to it that I think are really important to kind of pay attention to, but are at high level. And the first is sort of the project status. You probably can't read it from back there, but this is a, an area under the project status of things that have been accomplished during that month or the prior month some of the work that's current that we'll be working on um, during the month of the report. So this is work that's happening in September or was happening in September. And then upcoming milestones. So what are some of the big things that we have to have happen between now and the next monthly report? The other piece is that we have this design phase status um, sort of, uh, it's like a dashboard, if you will. And you'll see we're at um, schematic design, and then we'll get into design development, and then we'll get into construction documents, sorry, I'm still learning myself on the, the, the terminology. And lastly, we'll get into the permitting um, process. So here you'll also see a countdown um, 
how many months till groundbreaking? Nine months, we're looking at June 2019. And then there's an overview of sort of things that have happened, just general things that have happened in the month of September. As you work down, you'll see um, some conceptual pictures of some of the things that um, have changed and been modified and looked at during the previous month. And then there's a timeline up here that takes us through and it gives you a sense of where we are in that timeline. So while we, in that very first slide, it looked like we were really far along, um, we're still sort of pretty much at the beginning. Um, but this is an important moment um, for us, is right at the beginning, because this is where we sort of set the stage and set the path for what we're going to do as we move down the line. But I want to put that up there so that you had a chance to see it and can orient to it, because as you um, go on to our website, we do publish that once a month, and you'll have a chance to see it sort of at a glance. Some of the things that we've spent some time doing, um, and, and you've, many of you have seen this before, is we've spent a lot of time talking with folks about our, um, our schematic design and sort of what we're looking at. And it goes back, um, this one just goes back to um, August 2nd, we met with safety and security, we've had program review meetings with the executive team, we've met with all of the departments and all of the department chairs at the high school, uh, we've met with a community, we've met with over 200 students at this point, elementary, middle, and high school, to talk with them about what their hopes, dreams, and desires are for uh, their new high school as well. Um, but the idea here is, and I, I want to make sure that everybody understands, this, none of this work has, that I just sort of talked about is happening in a vacuum. It really is happening with the input of the experts that are our teachers at the school site. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move ahead. So we've got the experts of our teachers and we've also got our external experts that are helping us as well and then all of the community feedback that we've received. So some other things that have happened, the community outreach and subcommittee meetings, um, here are the dates that we've held those and all of these have been really important to us because they provided us some really high quality feedback about the design uh, and given us some really good food for thought because in each of them we've had places where people can put down questions that they have. Um, we have now curated all of those questions and you can go to our website and we've answered about 90% of every single question that we've gotten. So um, what we tried to do this with this project was um, not, not leave any stone unturned. So if your question was as simple as um, how many uh, bricks are going to be in the front walkway. We didn't just say thanks for your question. We actually figured out how many bricks were going to go in the front walkway and we actually answered it. So, um, so the point being that we're, we're taking each question and you'll be able to see that. But these monthly meetings and subcommittee meetings have been extraordinarily valuable to us uh, as we move forward with our project. So the current site design, and some of you may have seen this in the most recent meetings that we've had, um, is this. It hasn't changed all that much since the last time you saw it, but there is one subtle shift, and that is right here. Um, some of you might remember that these two bars, um, this is the fat bar and this is the skinny bar, that's what we're calling them now. Um, somebody said that'd be a great name for, the, um, for a band, the fat bar blues or something. Um, but anyway, the fat bar and the skinny bar, and originally these two bars were exactly parallel. And what that meant was that this main corridor, this heart of the school, if you will, um, was, was a little bit more narrow in the front than it is now. So there's a couple of things that by tilting this just slightly at an angle, this direction happens. And the first thing is that it gives us a little bit more space in the front, so more openness when you walk in. And the other thing that it does um, is that it orients the building slightly differently. Um, our orientation as a parallel was about three degrees different than what it is now. And what we learned was in the process of um, working with Tim Stevens and some other folks that have been really um, focused on environmental sustainability is if there were a way to sort of tip that a little bit more and orient it this direction, um, even by four or five degrees, we would be that much more efficient in the building. So we've been able to take that feedback and make that shift as well. Um, so that's the, that's the main substantive change that's happened in terms of the current site plan and design. So the design, however, has advanced um, rather significantly since we started. And sort of top level, um, I know you won't be able to read these, but I'll go through them a little bit more in detail in the slides to come. Um, but we started with really looking at the plan and making sure that it's right-sized. And, and when I say right-sized, I mean for the number of students we're going to have and for the budget that we have to work with making sure that it's focused on learning, so we're exploring some things with that, 
focusing on our performing arts. Um, this has sort of um, not come into play because of the community outreach. It just, unfortunately, in the grand scheme of length of time, it kind of came towards the end of the process. Um, but we have, we have some information we want to share today about that. Uh, kind of cleaning up the plan a little bit, making sure that it's really nice and tidy before we get into those, um, that, that next phase of design documents, and then focusing on the school community. So in terms of right-sizing the building, um, again, kind of where we started this process was that we wanted to build a school for 1,500. And I think in some ways, um, what happened was uh, the architects were very responsive to what our needs were and came out and said, we're going to design for you a building for 1,500. And that's what they did. Um, and so we said, let's, let's take a step back, knowing that we're not going to open with 1,500. Let's figure out what's the right size now and for the next 25 to 30 years as we move towards that 1,500. So we looked at organizational structures and spaces in the building so that when we open on day one um, in December of 2020 or January of 2021, we will have spaces on day one for 1,200 students at about an 85% utilization rate, which means that most of our teachers will have their own classrooms, almost all of them will have their own classrooms, um, but they'll also have desks and, and uh, workspaces beyond that. Um, but 1,200 will fit very nicely and very easily in that building on day one. But we also included in that ways that we can continue to grow. So in the updated designs that when we get to those and share those in November, you'll see that there are some spaces that can be recaptured later uh, for classroom space. A real focus on making sure that our net zero energy is ready. We're analyzing, again, the size and location of the mechanical equipment to make sure that the mechanical equipment, electrical, plumbing, and data infrastructure are in the right places to allow us to maximize the space inside of our building and also maximize our capacity to become net zero ready and to be uh, lead gold on day one. And, and some of that is uh, really helpful in the way that some mechanical systems have been relocated to allow for some more space for storage and the like in the, in, in the advanced design. Um, in terms of cleaning up the plan, making sure that we have really in, intuitive, user-friendly, and secure spaces. Um, so we did make some modifications inside the building to look at how do we vertically move kids up and down um, in a way that's intu intuitive, clear, good sight lines. And if we needed to lock down or we had a, an incident uh, that we could quickly move into um, that process. And so that has come along and that's been through um, conversations with Tom Palera and the uh, chief of police and some others helping us um, look at safety and security vetting all of our life safety codes and accessibility requirements, um, trying to improve natural light. One of the things that we bank on in this new building because we know it's great for kids and also good for our net zero energy is how do we get as much light from the outside in? Um, so we have, even with the reorientation, we have a little bit more light coming through that, that middle bar area, um, which is very helpful. And you can see from back to front now that you might not have been able to see from back to front before. So we've got some, some nice natural light coming in. Um, clear organization around classrooms and how they connect uh, in those two academic bars in a meaningful way. And very specifically, um, this I will drill down on a little bit further, very specifically at the beginning process of this um, design, we had administration, all administration, so principals, assistant principals, school counselors, psychologists, social workers, everybody on the first floor. And it isn't really in this building until you get to the third, fourth, and fifth floors that actual instructional programming starts because that's where most of our classroom spaces are. So we actually made a decision as a team in collaboration to move um, the assistant principals, social workers, psychologists, and the like up to the third floor so that they are co-located with students because that's where their services are needed. Um, so, so when we talk about connecting the two academic bars in a meaningful way, it means that those two bars can cross with um, all of our support services and students very, excuse me, very nicely. Um, focusing on learning, um, looking at adjacencies and balance for this 21st century learning spaces. Um, one of the things that has developed, um, it, it's really been interesting for me and, and somewhat fascinating to watch the input come in. Um, and if you looked at the flyover at the very beginning, what you saw in that flyover were kind of wide open spaces, a lot of movement, a lot of light. Um, and then as the process iterated, what ended up happening was there was so much conversation about, I need my space, I need my space, I need my space, 
that we ended up getting to a point where we were sort of designing a very traditional high school where there were halls and two classrooms on either side of the hall all the way around the square or the rectangle. And, and about a month ago, we, we stepped back and we said, is this, is this really what we envisioned as a community and as a school staff? And we pulled the school staff back in and we said, let's talk about that. And so we're kind of getting back to um, where we started, which is we're looking at really great collaborative open spaces for kids to be able to work, um, as opposed, in, not in isolation, but in collaborative teams with really good sight lines. So we have classrooms for sure, but there are also some really nice collaborative spaces that are kind of been born back out of the design. So uh, it's been kind of interesting to kind of see it ebb and flow as time has gone by. Uh, incorporating options for our special programs, um, looking at how are we going to provide large group testing and assessment opportunities. So as many of you know right now, um, we do rent space over at the Virginia Tech University of Virginia Center for our IB um, testing. And so are there ways that we can look at some spaces in the building that would allow us for that flexibility? Um, and then being able to host the IB art show in our own building is really important to us. And so we're looking at how some of those public spaces can be used for things like that. Um, the, the pouring arts uh, piece, uh, we are exploring how we can uh, maximize the proscenium width and depth. Um, one of the things uh, that we had a really great hour work session on the other night, on Tuesday night with the school board, and hopefully you've had a chance, if you, if you have questions about the arts, that's the place to go, because a lot of questions around the theater came up there and were answered. We had Sean Northrup, who's our theater teacher there, along with um, experts from the field talking about the theater itself. Um, but what we do know is that we are looking at how we can expand the proscenium or the opening of the, the stage a little bit more and looking at the width. Um, we're also looking at how we might be able to recapture some of the storage space to look at wing space so we can have a little bit more wing space uh, and the like. We are looking at incorporating a new music lab into our building. We have teacher planning areas for our arts teachers just like everyone else. Um, we are looking at public restrooms down in the basement. Um, and, and some of you might know from the original design, um, there are lots of locker rooms down there, but there weren't necessarily restrooms available for students. So we took a step back and say, why don't we have restrooms there for our kids? And so we've made some of those changes as well, um, looking at how we might be able to incorporate more storage and the like. Um, so that's been very useful, useful for us. And then we're also looking at what are the possibilities of including an arts maker space? Um, one of the things that we know around music and arts production is there's an awful lot that's going online and digital. Um, all of us get our music. We don't have, well, some of us do still have our vinyl, and some of us still have our eight track tapes and our cassettes, but most of our kids are getting music, for example, from uh, digital sources. And so how do, we, how do we leverage that and utilize that? So we are looking at the potential for an art, arts maker space where kids can produce uh, music. They can produce YouTube videos teaching other kids how to play guitar. They're, they could produce a lot of different opportunities um, and including even music videos potentially. So uh, the next is around focusing on the community, the school community itself. Uh, we reorganized the heart of the school. So if you remember we widened out that bar, we got away from the sort of cells and bells is what um, one of our architects is calling it. So if you think about a hallway with a double load corridor with classrooms on either side, not necessarily what we want. So looking at how do we create a better space in the building. Uh, to make sure that we have clear views from one side to the other, looking at space in the gym, the first, second, and third floors that could be used uh, for staging and community events. Um, we did also kind of go back and look at the first floor and say, okay, we've got, we've got a lot of different restroom options here. Should we put a family restroom in for nights that we have events and things like that? So we're looking at including a family restroom. And, and by the way, all of this came out of these community meetings and the feedback that you all have given us, and we appreciate that. Um, providing the indoor running track main level access before you would have to go downstairs and then potentially take an elevator to get up to the running track and so we've created an opportunity to be able to get to that running track uh, from the first floor. Um, reoriented the learning stair so you might remember when you if you looked at the flyover you saw that big learning stair. The learning stair is really beautiful and it's a great co concept but the way that it was designed before is it was a learning stair that looked out a window and we thought, okay, shouldn't we have it looking back into the school? And are there ways that we can utilize this as an additional teaching space and the like? So uh, we, we did reorient that to face the heart of the school, creating sort of that forum where we can host larger events, community events, or also um, student, uh, student performances. You know, if we want to do Shakespeare in the Park, and Sean Northrup says, you know, we're going to do 
uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, come on, you can sit on the, the learning stair, and they can do it right there in the open. So uh, it would give us a really nice sort of uh, additional intimate space for performance, perhaps. Um, so, so those are those are the big things that have really come from the um, development and community feedback that we're really working on. But there are other things too, and I want to um, tell you where to go to get the information. Um, so, if you go to our web page, www.fccps.org/campusproject, here um, this is our splash page, and you'll see the design of the front. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see George Mason Campus Project. If you click on that, it will take you to this page. And again, it, it's got the information about where we are. Um, and then on this left-hand side, there's a, a menu of options that you can look at. And here's what's on the menu of options. It's Q&A. So remember, all of those questions that we've received that we've answered, you can get those there. The latest events, what do we have that's upcoming? What are some things that we've done in the past? Um, we have a document repository. This is where we have all of the uh, information that we've shared at all of our meetings. All of the videos are there. Um, all, the play, all the things that we've done like this are there that have been videotaped, so you can go back and you can learn about the conversations that we've had. Um, the minutes from the Campus Coordinating Committee. So for those of you that don't know, there is a joint committee that Wyatt and I um, chair, along with our two uh, folks, one from Brailsford and Dunleavy and one from the general government. Uh, where we talk about the two projects and how are they working simultaneously and we meet once a month to make sure that we're looking at issues like storm water management, making sure we're looking at parking issues, making sure we're looking at transportation so that these two projects aren't happening as you know sort of in isolation. These two projects are sort of happening simultaneously but really keeping our eye on that in this campus coordinating uh, process. Um, here you'll see some uh, do documents that give a project overview and then um, Mary Beth Conley put together a really great history of the GMHS campus project. And it goes back how many years, Mary Beth? From the 1950s. From the 1950s. So it kind of gives you a, a, a long history of where we have been and where we are now uh, and the like. Linda, you remember that? Sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. 69. 69, all right. Um, so, so that's where we are. Um, I am super excited about the development that's been happening with this project. Um, I think we've come a million miles from where we were this time last year. Um, I think we've made some really nice progress in looking at how things fit together in adjacencies. Um, but the big idea I want to make sure that I communicate today, um, I think more than anything, is, is my appreciation of our staff at the high school who have provided us incredible input, incredible feedback about each of these spaces. We've met with all of our coaches. We've met with all of our theater folks. We've met with all of our music folks. We've met with all of our arts folks and all of our English, social studies, science, language arts, et cetera, uh, teachers. Um, and they have really given us good feedback in this process. In addition to that, I, I do want to thank Brailsford and Dunleavy. Daisy Brangman's here from Brailsford and Dunleavy. Uh, and they've been able to leverage for us resources that have been incredible. So, uh, for example, on Tuesday night at the school board work session, we had Polysonic come in, who is our, um, the, the group that is our consultant helping us with the theater. They've done the Kennedy Center. They've done Wolf Trap. They've done Strathmore. They've, they are the experts in acoustical design and theater design and have been really helpful in, in those uh, pieces. We have experts that are going to be coming in to help us with other pieces as well. So. Um, Anyway, we're really excited. I, I was going to take more than 10 minutes. I told you that, though, I think, right? Mm -hmm. You've done it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, and I appreciate your time here today. So uh, before I turn it over to Mr. Shields to do his piece about the community 10-acre uh, piece, an economic development piece, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there has been some um, movement in finding a, a little bit more parking. Right now, we're at about 450 spaces of surface parking currently for George Mason and Mary Ellen Henderson. And I think we're right around 400 now. So every time we meet with our person, we, we gain a few more spaces. Those 400 spaces are surface spaces for us. Um, but what I, what I will tell you is that, and Wyatt can probably speak to this a little bit too, is that we have met with both of the finalists for the development uh, on the 10-acre site, and we have 
given, and I hope I'm not saying anything I'm not supposed to say, but um, you can just give me the nudge if, if I am. But I think we've asked both of them to help us with some parking solutions for the high school. And, um, and both of them are agreeable. So even if we picked up 50 additional spaces, that would get us back to at least where we are now. Um, so I'm really actually quite confident that we're gonna end up with more parking on this new site than what we currently have. And that's, that's important. Lindy, and then Tom. Yeah, middle school playground. <laughs> yeah, the middle school playground. Um, we are gaining a ton of space in a lot of different spots on this campus. Yeah, like <laughs> well, it's all located in the back, right? So um, what, just for everybody's edification, what Lindy's talking about is when we do, and I'll, I'll just go all the way back, um, when we do the demolition for, um, for the high school, or the excavation, it's not even demolition, um, remember, this is the new high school here. The middle school cafeteria is about where my pointer is, and if you go out that door, there's a blacktop here, and then there's this big practice field here. So there are a couple of things that we've talked about, and we're still exploring those. Um, one is the potential use for some of the, the surfaces over here, right? Could we put a couple of rolling basketball hoops um, and that's a possibility, and we've talked with some folks there. There's also some space in here that might be available for a blacktop during some time. But we also have this, this huge um, replacement field. So remember, the, the practice field was here. We've relocated the practice field down here. And so there may be some opportunity down there uh, for some spots too. But we are paying attention to it. We know that the loss of the basketball hoop in particular is sort of in question, so if there's a way so if there's a way we can recreate um, a, a basketball area for the middle school students that maybe they don't have to go too far for, maybe even in here, if we could gate off a spot here during the school day uh, and put a hoop in there, we might be able to work something out. Sure. Yeah. Good point. Tom. Yeah, uh, I don't know the answer to that, except that I have um, personally reached out to um, the dean, not the dean, but the, the director of programs here at Virginia Tech and asked him if we could utilize some of that space for a fee during the construction process. And he's running it up the flagpole at Virginia Tech. Um, but it's a very, very slow process. Um, but we are talking with them about it. Uh, last year, we were able to utilize some of the parking for additional overflow parking for our students who got their licenses later in the year, for example. Um, and we got a little bit of a reduced fee, about a dollar a day less than what they were charging. Um, but I would say, um, from a school's perspective, it's, it's been slow going at best. Any chance to recapture <laughs> I can't answer that question. I'm just the school superintendent. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, what are the plans for doing the construction and then putting the construction starts here and you're after the middle school for PE for going outside and for recess for going outside? We need 45 minutes, but it's not enough time to trek from the gym all the way down to the remaining field. Yeah, so we've talked with uh, Mr. Coffrin and, and the folks at, at Henderson. Um, of, you know, obviously we have the gym already, and the gym's going to be remaining intact. Uh, the, the, the two gyms at the high school that are existing will remain intact because we're not, remember, we're not tearing down the high school, so that may be another opportunity. The field is being untouched. We're not doing anything there, and we're not doing anything with the baseball field. And so I, I understand what you mean about the, the walk down this way. Um, but the other thing that we're looking at, and this is sort of tangential but associated, is um, we're looking at minutes of PE instruction at the middle school anyway, because I'm not sure that 45 minutes is, is meeting the requirement. So if we had a little bit more time, that might actually help us out with getting kids to and from fields um, and field spaces. But they'll have, they'll have the, the stadium field, they'll have the baseball field, um, they'll still have all the spaces over here at the high school if, if we need to. Um, the, one, the only one space that they're losing is that, that black top that has the basketball court. Everything else is still in play. Yes? While we're on the surface questions, um, I see that there's like one big plus hoop, I guess, along the front of the new school. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, I see that uh, on the buses, <clears throat> what about pickups and drop-offs? I mean, you want to discourage individual pickups and drop-offs, but the, the bad thing is that happen. So where would the parents be? Where would those cars be, be going? I mean, if they're not safe for them. Yeah, I'm going to ask Daisy Brangman from Brailsford and Dunleavy to talk a little bit about the site circulation. Um, so, and, and some of this, by the way, Maria, is a little bit in the abstract because we don't know what's going to happen here on the 10-acre site yet also. So one of the things we're really excited about is getting that team on board so that they can work with Gilbane and Stantec and Quinn Evans to develop the best process for the site circulation through here. Um, but we'll, we'll share with where we are currently. This is the red button. That's the laser, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so we did have a meeting with the um, Falls Church City Public Schools transportation team, and they actually gave us a lot of really good and, and insightful information as to how many buses there are, like what the timing is for that. So as of this moment, and based on that conversation, and again, this is all still very fluid, um, buses come in through here, and they would exit this way. Um, Drop-off and pickup would happen for the high school in this trapezoid here. Um, Mariel and Henderson, it would not change. It would still happen here. What you're still seeing here, which is not going to be the case, the, the site plan hasn't been fully updated, is this bus parking is now going off site. So that's where we've gained a lot of parking spaces to get us close to that 400 number. So there's, there's a circulation that's going to be worked out between Mariel and Henderson to allow folks to come in and out here. Uh, the high school to come in and out through here, keeping this for buses only in the morning and in the afternoons, of course, with operational logistics being worked out. Right. I, I, my question was, if you've got the cars over in the parking lot, are mm -hmm. you getting the parking lot tomorrow in the afternoon? But um, the, where the students park, uh, it's not a place where you would want So, yeah, again, it would be a, an operational not, and the design team continues to work, you know, of course, with the transportation team as well as, as this develops. Um, what you can't see clearly here, and I believe the last term for this was the Grove, this is a, a pedestrian area. So what would be encouraged, and this takes you directly into the main entrance of the school for the high school. So it would be encouraged is if you're doing drop off or pick up, a line would form or some sort of circulation would form around here and students would come through here to come into the parking lot. Along that same line though, would they be using the uh, road for exit to Haycock? Exit this way? So in the mornings, in the mornings and in the afternoons, this would be currently the plan is this would be entry only for buses. Yes. So in the afternoon, the buses would be lined up here to pick up their kids. In the morning, the buses would come in, they drop off the kids, and they would leave this way. But cars come in off of Route Seven. Yeah. You're allowed to come in off of Route 7 this way. No. Well, that, that that's the future back, plan. Back further that you can. Yeah. Yeah, back further, but not yeah. right there. But we've been working with safety and security yeah. on that as well. Anything else? So, so you have an older version. There's been a lot of updates, and we did the update on Tuesday night with the board. I would really encourage you to look at that because it does talk about where 
Um, the design is for the, the dressing rooms and the access backstage. We talk about the two freight elevators that come up from the basement. We talk about reducing the wing uh, storage on the wing spaces so we can have more wing space. Um, Mary Jo has blessed everything that we've done so far and has been very happy with what we're doing. We continue to modify it and adapt it based on her feedback. But Mary jo, we've met with Mary Jo, um, with Jamie Sample, and with Sean Northrup extensively about these designs. Um, in fact, the design of the, the um, art spaces below the auditorium is, is not uncommon at universities. It happens all the time. Like most, most of the auditoriums you walk into and are at street level, and everything happens below them. So it's not an unusual approach. So um, if, if you'll just give us a little time, that whole piece is, is, is resolving in a way that all of our arts folks are really pleased with. Um, we just haven't put everything out that we can because we're still working on it. And we don't, this is the problem with showing you too much because <laughs> you get sort of stuck in the last version you saw uh, without knowing that there is additional information. And so um, that takes me to the timeline and I'll let you in just a second. Um, we are not sharing, we had originally said that we were gonna share the, um, the, the SDs at this meeting, that we were gonna come out and show what the final you know, SDs were. Um, there's been too much community feedback and too much information to get to that point today, um, and it's all been good. And so we're just finalizing the design over the next two weeks, um, vet, revetting it with the staff, revetting it with our experts. And so at the next Sunday series, our architects will come and they will share out what the final um, SDs are. So that will be a really good time. But I, I do encourage you to talk with Mary Jo and with Sean and with Jamie because they've seen a different plan that has different different than what you've seen. So let me. So let me. Let me. First of all, say whatever we have is going to be way better than what we have now. Um, there's no doubt that the the school we're building, with the input of our teachers and with our experts, they've already told us it's going to be far superior to what we have now. In terms of the space that's there, um, I, I do want to make sure everybody understands that at the very beginning of this process, back in August, actually before the referendum was passed, we met with all of our teachers to talk about the ed specifications. What are the requirements of each of the spaces um, with respect to um, depth, height, uh, width, you know, width, et cetera. And so we are working off an ed specification that has been clarified with all of our teachers. Um, so. So it's going to be really important to in, in some ways to remember that because the, I think it, 
it drives everything that we're doing in, in many ways in terms of the shape. So what you, when you say it's like a jigsaw puzzle, it is a jigsaw puzzle. And it's a jigsaw puzzle because we're doing um, a vertical space um, very differently than we have. So, um, you know, the flow and, and the <laughs> movement around continues to be shaped as we go through this SD. So I appreciate your feedback. I think it's good for us to take that back. Um, but I do want to assure you and, and the community that what we're going to have at the end of this is way superior to what we have currently. And, um, and, and, I, and I'm excited about it, and I know our arts teachers are excited about it, um, and, and we're ready to, to really put on some pretty great shows. So we're working on it. Yes, sir. Well, bus storage is not it. <laughs> um, I, think move, I think being able to move bus storage off-site is really a positive. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know that I have... The vertical space ver versus the horizontal space certainly creates some new challenges, um, but it's not without um, its positives as well. And I think one of the things that is really positive and, about the vertical space is it creates some synergies and some... Um, collaboration between and among programs that you don't get in those bigger spread out spaces. However, in those bigger spread out spaces, you do have an opportunity to do some additional programming like a swimming pool, um, maybe some uh, extra spaces outside. Um, you know, one of the things that's come up is where are there sort of places for kids to kind of commune? Are there park spaces and things like that? And so that's forcing us to be really intentional about what happens like out in this area here in the front, in this corner here. How are we looking at this, uh, these spaces here and this, this corner? Um, it also is forcing us to look at even the building design itself. Are there ways that we can incorporate more outdoor space in the building? And I think that one of the things that if, uh, that, that a, a bigger, um, footprint allows you is some more of those kinds of opportunities. So we're getting, we're getting creative and we're getting thoughtful about how we might be able to, to work through those. Um, I think the community, if, if it had its druthers, might be interested in a swimming pool. Um, I, I know right now we don't have the space for it nor the, the funding for it, um, but I think if, if down the line there were some need to put one in, um, you know, we could certainly carve out some space if we worked out some parking issues elsewhere, but I think that would be down the line. <laughs> an ideal part of that is the question park. Yeah. And I did want to say just thank you a lot for being here. I have a lot fewer concerns as far as the rest of the board is concerned. Thank you. And everybody should watch that Tuesday night video. Yeah. It was excellent. Oh, thanks. Very easy to get kids back. Thank you. Yes, sir. For the last <coughs> three weeks, the press has had cover stories about the fly ball case. That's a lot of coverage for one relatively small piece of I, I think Tuesday night resolved it. Yeah, yeah. We so so the fly loft is an interesting, and I, I won't go into rehashing the whole Tuesday night meeting. And and it, and I say rehashing, and it wasn't a bad. I don't mean that in a negative connotation. It was a, I think a really important night for our experts to come in and talk about it. So Sean Northrup was there. We had Polly Sonic was there. Um, and, and there's a, a distinction that may be worth making here that I think is important, and that is uh, when we talked about the fly loft originally, um, we weren't drawing the distinction between the flying in of two-dimensional backdrops and rigging for lights and the like. And one of the things that I want to be really clear about is that we're still going to have rigging in our theater for lights so they can drop down, they can be manipulated and moved. We're also going to have, it won't be a, uh, a catwalk per se, but a mesh deck, which serves the same purpose as a catwalk, but the mesh deck is much safer. So if you think about a, a wire panel that has really small holes that you walk on instead of these really narrow sort of walkways. Um, so we're going to still have those just like any theater has. The only piece that we won't have is the 60 feet above the pre proscenium that would allow for those two-dimensional sets to fly in. There's a number of reasons why. Um, 
and, and I want to make sure everybody understands this too, Sean Northrup, our theater teacher, has used the fly system for those two-dimensional sets once in the seven years that he's been there for a show. So first and foremost, it just isn't used by our, by our faculty and staff at George Mason. Um, this, the second is it's very expensive to use. Um, that's part of the reason he doesn't use it, is that the backdrops, just the uh, cloth alone, cost $3,000, and then on top of that, there's, and if you have eight layers of those, um, you know, that's $24,000 in uh, burlap that has to be painted, um, so it's cost prohibitive. Um, there are new technologies out there that are really outstanding that universities and colleges are using that can project three-dimensional uh, type images on the backdrop. So we are talking about um, sliding actually um, some of the stage forward to gain more depth so that we can put in a, a cyclorama that you can actually, a, a, psych, a, a psych, some of you might know it, it's a big thin cloth that goes around the back of the theater that you can actually project sets from behind on or there are ways to project into. Um, so we're looking at those solutions. There are also ways to do rolled sets, rolled riggings, they're called oleos, that you, you, drop the, um, you drop the set, but it's just rolled. There's also ways that you can do it on a rigging where it comes up in thirds. So if you don't want it rolled, it can kind of come up in sort of a sheeted way. Um, so there's a lot of different options that are out there that are probably more progressive than a, than a 60 foot above the proscenium height, which would then impact the next floor up and reduce our floor space by four classrooms. And then the last piece of it um, is, you know, and, and not to um, be too protective, but the Virginia Municipal League has told us we, we really would prefer that you not put one in. That's our insurer. You can put one in and we'll still insure you, but if something were to happen, just know that you've been put on notice. The Virginia Department of Education suggests that we don't put them in as well. So there's a lot of different um, things at play here. So when we talked about it at the school board meeting um, the other night and our experts weighed in and Sean Northrup, our theater director, weighed in, um, it became very clear to the school board um, that, it, that it was not a good idea. So I think we had a good opportunity to share information with each other and make a good decision as a team about what to do with that fly loft. Yes, sir. I have a question about the process you talked about where we're in the schematic design, then we're going to get into the development design, which I'm assuming at the end of that we're going to have build ready plans. And mm -hmm. So it's a classic waterfall process. You go to one stage, stage by stage. The, the hang up with classic waterfall is then you get to this point and then you have to build, and at the end of the build, you, you basically have a school that was designed two years earlier. So can you talk to the change process so that once we have those plans, during that time between when we say, okay, this is it, <coughs> and we open the door to students, things change, mm -hmm. things evolve. How are we going to embrace that evolution so that we can say, school for that day, not yeah. for the two years, not two years old? That's a great question, and, and I would actually address it to say also for the next 20 years, 30 years, and 50 years, because we don't want a static building that can't modify, adapt, and change as needs come up or changes in program come up. So, so the first way is that um, the design, the way that it's being done, is sort of modularized in that, um, and I, I, I can't, I wish I had something to show you that would sort of describe it, but it's sort of these posts that come up on 10 or 20 feet um, lengths or whatever they are that you could you build blocks right so there's blocks classrooms are 800 square feet and then you can double it to 1600 square feet or you can double it again to 32 so there's very there's really beautiful symmetry in the building that allows for the flexibility and modification um, and that would be for years to come down the line right but for the next two years, and this is where it does become a little bit complicated, is once we get past schematic design, and we've got the geometry right, and we get those schematic design documents from um, Gilbane uh, and Stantec and Quinn Evans and move into design development, changes that we make are born, uh, the costs are born from us then at that point. So there's still the possibility to make changes, but as we start to make big changes, we just need to know that we may need to pay for those kinds of changes. Now, we've been in conversations with them. They've already said they're gonna be really flexible with us, and part of the reason they're gonna be flexible is because of the speed to which we're doing this. I mean, we really are pedal to the metal here trying to get this thing done. So, um, so I'm excited about um, knowing that they're gonna be flexible with us and help us through that process. 
But we'll continue to stay current with all of the educational programming that's out there, all the changes that may be coming down the pike. Um, I actually am leaving here today <laughs> to go down to Charlottesville for uh, the Virginia uh, superintendents uh, group we meet once a year and there's architects there and there are experts in education and so we'll continue to kind of stay focused on it so if there are changes that need to be made uh, we can make those we just need to be really thoughtful about how to do that but the building itself will allow it because of the way that it's being designed you're not going to see in this building the other part of this is um, again I, I might be getting too deep into the weeds here but this building um, is built with a frame structure that doesn't support any CMU, which is concrete block. And, and the reason it won't support concrete block is because of the load of that, which means that um, the, the cladding has to be something different and interior structures have to be able to move around. And the reason that we did it that way was if we ever needed a large space, it would be much easier to take down a high impact drywall wall as opposed to a concrete block wall so that we can create spaces that more adequately meet our needs. Sure. Absolutely. For sure. Thank you. That's good feedback. Yeah, um, it, probably one of two spaces, sort of just generally. One is on the bottom floor within the arts, embedded within the arts, and the other uh, is on the same floor with the administrative uh, first floor of curriculum and content um, so that we can integrate some of the arts into the other programs as well. Yeah, the Think a Bit Lab. Mm -hmm. We're, we're actually revising our community use policy right now um, and trying to figure out ways, one, to make it easier to access our building, because if you go onto our website, it's a little bit hard to figure out how to like, get into our school, so we're fixing that, and the other is to figure out the fee structure and the like. Um, so I, I would say at this point, nothing's off the table. Um, I think one of the, it's really good in, input and feedback though that uh, STEAM and STEM lab might, and makerspace might be something that the community wants to use. So um, let us take that back and, and think of it, <laughs> if you will. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I'm sure this is not unique to Falls Church, but it seems like some of the recent projects that the city has undertaken kind of go through a conceptual phase. Um, <coughs> city Hall, Mount Daniel, Big Chimney's Park and so forth. And then once we get to the relatively the end of the process, we find out that it costs a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. And that requires some soul searching, you know, to go back and think of mm -hmm. what can we change, what can we do later, that sort of thing. As you go through the SB and D process, is there a way to keep in touch with what that translates to in terms of a cost structure? Mm -hmm. We can avoid some of that at the end of the process? We are on it every day. <laughs> That's a really great question. Um, Yes, we, we are actually, um, as we continue to refine our SDs, it's being repriced on a routine basis so we can kind of see. We also have a VM log, so we have a log of things that are things that we want, um, but we don't uh, necessarily think we can get. Um, so if there is extra money that comes along, we're gonna kind of look at some of those things, but we also need to look at, in that VM log, some things that perhaps we would wanna consider taking out uh, if it did come in higher. So, so we are, we're paying very close attention to it. The other thing we're paying really close attention to is the tariffs um, that have come into play. You know, we're gonna be buying a lot of steel um, for this. We're buying photo, we're not buying photovoltaics. Somebody else, we hope, will be buying those photovoltaics for us, but um, you know, those PV arrays are, um, are part of the tariff as well. Um, so we are negotiating with the city and continuing our conversation about how best to potentially buy out some of those things early so we can get ahead of the tariff so that we can potentially save some money. But we're looking at a, a lot of different structures and possibilities for us to be able to reduce that 
concern down the line when we get to the end and go, oh my gosh, we need five more million dollars to finish this project. We do not want to get there uh, and are paying very close attention to that. Yes, ma'am. There, there are some standards that we have to meet with, with respect to acoustical sound um, absorption and the like, and we wouldn't do anything that would be outside of what's required. Um, and what's in the plan now um, is probably beyond sufficient to, uh, with respect to sound absorption, so I wouldn't anticipate that that would be anything that we would look at. I'm thinking about sort of what's on our VM log right now, and that's not even something that we would consider. You know, some of the considerations, um, just as an, I'll just give an example, um, are the, the flooring, you know, are, are there spaces that we don't need a certain type of flooring where we can get a different type of flooring that might be less expensive? Those are the kinds of things that we would consider. Um, anything that we would consider wouldn't impact the overall use of the building or the, or the general quality of the building. Um, I, I don't have any interest in taking the money that this community voted for and putting something out there that was less than what you expected. So I think we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have really great, a really great building. No. 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 Yeah. yeah, sorry. Both LEED and International Building Code actually have minimum requirements for all types of spaces. It's not just a general blanket uh, sound absorption, or, or I forgot what the exact term is, but it goes down into auditorium spaces, music spaces, classroom spaces, exactly what the requirements are that need to be met. So we're going to either meet or exceed those. And it can be done, you know, without CMU. It can be done with high impact drywall. It's all based on insulation, the size of your wall. All right. Yes, sir. We've talked about it's called core and shell, essentially. So you you develop the core and kind of leave it as a shell. Um, we would consider it, but I don't know that we. Um, would save all that much money. It's on the margin, really, because you're still building the foundation, you're still putting in the floor, and you, you know, you're just not finishing out the space. So that may not be the best place to get a bang for our buck, if you will. I'm hopeful that we're not gonna get there. We're, we're really trying to build um, around a budget that gives us some flexibility um, so that we can get everything we need um, within the budget that we have. And I, I know that that sounds a little Pollyanna-ish, probably, but I, I'm sort of, hopelessly optimistic that that's going to happen. All right, I'm going to turn it over. Thank you. Thank you for your time, your energy, your thoughts. Um, I would say to you, we still have the website set up. So uh, the website, and we also have the email, which is newgmhs at fccps.org. So if you want to send us more information, please don't hesitate to do that. Um, and please go out and look at the stuff we have that's out there. I hope that it answers um, most of the questions you have. So thanks. Here you go, Wyatt. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so I'm gonna, I've got, I think, about six slides just to provide an update on the economic development piece and happy to answer any questions on that from you as well. And, and, and obviously, Peter will still be here if there are any follow-up questions on the school design. Yes, please. Thank you. So um, this is, you, we've already covered this, but this, this Sunday series, as has been noted, is, is a long-standing commitment to keep the community up to date and to, to stay engaged with you in, in 
multiple ways as we continue our planning for the project. So I'm going to talk about the economic development piece, and, it, and I always lead with this slide because why are we opening 10 acres up for economic development on the, on the high school site? And uh, from the beginning, really five years ago when we began this planning process, it was viewed as an opportunity to lower the cost to the taxpayers to get a state-of-the-art state of high school. Our budget, obviously, is $120 million. It's about $6 million in annual debt service to service that, and that's about 15 cents on the tax rate. So we're trying to uh, lessen that impact on our tax rares, uh, taxpayers as we go forward. Uh, this is a schedule, and this is really just the, the schedule from starting in December of 2017, just uh, under a year ago. But really, the planning for this project goes back, um, well, really about 10 plus years. But five years is when we've been really kind of intensely planning this project. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, the, you know, this column is the economic development, kind of key milestones. Uh, Peter covered the, this column, which is the, the school key milestones. But we're right now in the process of trying to work towards a selection of our top-ranked <coughs> economic development partner. Um, and so that process uh, began in March last year um, with a request for uh, conceptual proposals. In June, we put out a request for detailed proposals for the top-ranked respondents to the request for conceptual proposals. And August 29th is when we received those. So we've had those proposals in hand now for just about a month and a half. And so what we've been doing over that month and a half is evaluating them and asking questions about them and also giving the respondents the opportunity to refine their proposals um, in response to additional follow-up questions that the city has had. The executive summaries, which I'm going to give a very high-level summary of, are on the city website. Um, this is the EYA PN Hoffman uh, Regency uh, Plan. So this is uh, th those three groups are working together. Um, and what, that, what this project has, I'll talk about some of the uses. Um, but one of the features of this plan is a, a shared parking deck that is closer to the school. We're working, we have a lot of questions about that, what it would look like, how it would function. Um, but when Peter mentioned earlier that we're discussing with the developers about how we can have shared parking, really surge parking is, is, is one way to think of it for football games, for PTA nights, for any kind of major um, athletic events that the city has. Uh, to open up the economic development por uh, piece uh, so that we can um, have our, our folks park there. The office building is what most naturally uh, lends itself to shared parking. The office building will be empty at night uh, when our biggest activities are happening. Uh, but the way this layout um, is, is, this would be a multifamily with uh, retail on the first floor. This would be great groceries anchored. Uh, this building is about six stories or seven stories tall. Um, the, uh, there's a hotel in this project. Uh, there's senior living in this project. And this project is also designed to be built with the majority, including this promenade, which is sort of the central spine um, lined with retail on both sides, uh, would be built in the first phase. And then this piece uh, would be built as a second phase. Um, the intent also is to have lots of sort of throughways to the school feeding towards the high school, including a pedestrian only uh, route uh, um, and a, a civic amenity space here. Um, some of the uses that are in the uh, EYA proposal, as I mentioned, a grocery anchored uh, retail mix. Uh, just about 10% of the total project is retail, um, a hotel, um, <coughs> approximately. Uh, uh, 391 square feet of office, about 288 multifamily apartments, 245 condos, uh, affordable housing that, that uh, meets the, uh, existing city policy, and senior housing. Uh, that promenade provides open space, which is uh, just about an acre. Uh, so that's a quick summary of, of the EYA proposal. Uh, rush mark, uh, which sh uh, shown here is in, in three dimensions. Uh, which is how they've shown it in their executive summary. Uh, but this building has an office building on the corner, um, uh, multifamily over uh, retail. Their civic space uh, ties in with their proposal that they've made to Virginia Tech. Um, 
uh, for uh, sort of a shared civic space with the university. Um, I should have noted with the EYA, their tallest building and Rushmark's tallest building are similar. Uh, Rushmark's tallest building is 15 stories, and uh, EYA's tallest building is right here, and it's of a similar height. Uh, the rest of the buildings tend to be um, uh, in that seven, uh, six to seven story uh, range. Uh, so here's a, a list of the uses with Rushmark. Um, uh, uh, retail component um, of 148,000 square feet, 151,000 square feet of office, a hotel, uh, approximately 750 apartments, 120 condos, uh, affordable housing uh, per existing city policy, and a three-quarter acre um, uh, public space that also, as I mentioned, would tie into to a, a, a plaza that would be on the Virginia Tech side as well. Um, just one note on Virginia Tech, uh, EYA has put in a proposal to Virginia Tech as well. There may be others, uh, and we anticipate that Virginia Tech will be posting those proposals publicly uh, fairly soon as well so, so the community can see those. So the evaluation uh, process, uh, there is an evaluation committee that has been formed that has representation from the school board, um, the superintendent, planning commission, economic development authority, uh, the city's planning director is on the evaluation committee, uh, as well as two council members and myself. And we're being, uh, we have our commercial real estate advisor and the city attorney who, uh, who is assisting us with this. There are three big areas of, 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 of evaluation and those uh, include value to the city, the quality of the development program, and our evaluation of, their, uh, of the risk or, or the execution risk associated with their project. Um, the council ultimately will be making the decision on the top-ranked proposer. We anticipate we're working towards having that decision be made in November. And the way that that decision is going to be made is to enter into what we'll call an interim agreement with the top-ranked uh, proposer. And in that interim agreement, what it basically does is it lays out the schedule uh, working towards May of 2019 where they would uh, um, have a comprehensive agreement which would include all the transaction details and at the same time approval for their, uh, for their land use application so that they would have entitlements uh, for the development program as well. So uh, some key steps in that. They will first have a uh, due diligence period. In January of 2019 is where we anticipate they'll have submitted a special <coughs> exception application. And then in February, that will be referred out to boards and commissions. Um, and then uh, in May 2019, final consideration of that application and the comprehensive agreement. It's really important to note also that we then have two years for the construction of the high school. So then the selected developer uh, can continue their work uh, with our neighbors, uh, with uh, Virginia Tech on uh, uh, shared planning, uh, getting permits from VDOT for access to the site. We'll go through the planning commission for their site plan. Um, uh, they'll get their financing. So there's a two-year period uh, will there be much more refined planning that will happen after that, that uh, comprehensive agreement is, uh, is executed. So uh, we've put all of the information that we're able to at this point on the city website and uh, are, are uh, soliciting comments on it. But we anticipate we'll have a much more public um, aspect of, of this, uh, the economic development piece uh, once that interim agreement is signed. We've picked the top ranked. Um, and then we'll, we'll engage on the, on the, the uh, development program and all the details of, uh, of their proposals. So with that summary, let me stop and then uh, I'll, I'll uh, invite any questions that you have. I should have noted uh, when, when uh, Peter was discussing for the microphone, um, I will just try to repeat the question so that people uh, can, who will be watching this online can, uh, can follow what the question is. Yes, sir. You mentioned that the, both of the proposals have grocery stores. There's already giant across the street and Harris Teeter down the block. Why do we need another grocery store? Um, the, uh, the question is, why do the two proposals have a, a grocery store? 
Yeah, uh, it's been a point of discussion with them. I think the view is that the grocer would need to be a complementary grocer to the grocer that is there. I think there is a view amongst uh, people in that space that that's feasible. Uh, food is uh, probably the most solid aspect of retail uh, today in today's retail uh, world. Uh, retail is changing, it's really dynamic, um, and food is really where retail has been going in terms of, of um, what, what people want. And, um, but uh, it's part of our evaluation of execution risk as well. Yes? So the question is about 15 stories. Uh, is that out of place? Is that too tall for the site? Um, so a couple of things I'll say in response to that. Um, one, in the city's planning for the site, uh, we adopted a, uh, a comp plan amendment uh, in January last year. And in that comprehensive plan amendment, there was discussion about how high, what, what, what are appropriate heights. And 15 stories was identified as, uh, as, as a number that was a, a reasonable planning number. Uh, the Planning Commission had a lot of discussion whether there should be any limit, um, and uh, you know, ultimately the, the discussion went around about 15 stories. Um, in the zoning that has been uh, applied for this site, which was adopted in August, 15 stories actually was identified as, as the cap. Um, so that is a signal actually that the city sent um, to the development community in terms of what would be appropriate for this site. And the reason for those higher uh, heights was the fact that it is well served by transit. It's uh, well served by I-66. There's, there's a lot of transfer, transportation infrastructure there, and so it is a place that it seems reasonable that can handle density. Um, now I'm going to say something a little bit different. When, when, um, when you look at the overall density of what's proposed, it is about um, in the between 3 FAR floor area ratio and 3.5 FAR. And, um, and that's because they do have open space in their proposals. Some of their buildings are not as tall also. And those FARs are actually pretty typical for the downtown of, of City of Falls Church. So when you look at overall density, um, even though there are some buildings here that are taller, it actually is a density pattern that is pretty similar to commercial districts in the city of Falls Church. Um, so that's, that is, we've, we were real curious as to how the market would respond um, to this, this question of density. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that, that's, that's what they have thought would work here. Um, but I think it's also responsive to a signal the city sent uh, in the comp plan amendment and in the zoning. Yes. Yes. Um, that is a good question, and I uh, don't know off the top of my head. Um, that is a public document as well, um, and so I think I'll just need to get back with you on that. So that 15 stories may not be far off, possibly. You know, that's, a, that, that's a good point. I do think it is, um, my recollection is they are not that tall, um, but I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to check. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about um, that ACOG Route 7 traffic? So, I mean, yes. I, even, even before any of this happened, there are parents out trying to get out of the car from crashing to the And there's just now I, we see a lot more traffic through our city because you can avoid some. Bottom line is there is a 
struggling already in the struggle in the food trafficking in this town that's just that tough through youth development is very dense and doesn't I, I'm wondering what the city's proposal is planning to to build infrastructure to adults because currently I I I can't see that certain kind of thing that anyone's gonna want to get into adults. Well um you could take either one. Either w so the question is about traffic at, at Haycock Road and um, and Route Seven, and this is a very busy intersection, um, and you do typically have congestion behind it in both directions. That's the that's the current state, and Haycock Road also gets stacked up in this way. So this is this is a key planning issue for the site. Um, some of the things that we think will be uh, positive for this intersection is the fact that the traveling public will have options that, you know all the load is on this intersection now and if there is uh, viable routing right through the heart of the site um, that that can help spread out the load uh, for traffic the um, and, and we're working with with VDOT right now on the traffic counts the projected counts from this development and how all that will be managed the um, one thing that I will just say about density and traffic sort of in general about the city of Falls Church, um, most of our traffic on Route 7 is passed through traffic. It originates out the city, outside of the city limits and uh, its destination outside, is outside of the city limits. As we have built uh, buildings in the city and we've built approximately 10 in the past 15 years or so that taken together have significantly more um, density and more units than what is shown here. The traffic count data in the city has actually been quite consistent. Um, we have not had an increase in trips on Route 7 with the additional buildings that have been built in the city. Now, is that, why is that? There's probably a lot of theories, but um, one of the things that the city has been trying to do is if we're going to have traffic on our streets, let's have it be traffic that is actually people doing business uh, in the city of Falls Church as opposed to people just passing through and not doing business in the city of Falls Church, which is a pretty dominant factor of it today. Um, and so it's possible that people who are trying to pass from point A to point B, they'll choose a different route and more of the traffic that's, that's local will actually be locally generated and locally destined traffic. Um, but this is a big dialogue we're having with VDOT right now, and, um, and, and we will do all the things we can to, to, make, this, uh, to make this work. Yes, we'll go here and then and back. Right, wouldn't the 15.7 million that we recently got from the state, wouldn't that help with some of the infrastructure? Um, yes, yeah, so the question is about the $15.7 million grant that uh, we've gotten from the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, and they're I'm sure there are people in this room who helped um, uh, work to get that grant awarded to the city. What that grant is specifically for is for transportation improvements associated with this project. And the way we, yeah, um, <laughs> I, people online might not be able to hear, but there are a lot of exuberant kids uh, yelling that we can hear. Um, so what that grant is for is to try to help people get access uh, to this site. Um, and access West Falls Church Metro. Um, and, and the intent is that to make it safe for all modes of traffic, um, including walkers, including cyclists, including people who are accessing the site via transit, and including people who are accessing the site by car. Um, and so that's, that's a significant amount of money. I think we'll be able to make some positive changes uh, with, with those funds. And, and, um, that we so, would have had to come up with. Yes. And That's right. That's right. Yes. I was just wondering, um, so it's not helpful without I was talking about how one of the problems for development that same with the bike that was terrible. Right. Uh, so the question is how will we ensure that with this development that we it has the features that will enliven the space, space and make it a place that people will want to come to. Is that the basic question? 
So when we put out the request for proposals, I, I mentioned you know, the three things that we're going to be evaluating them on, value to the city to help pay for the high school, um, and the development program, and then execution risk. So that concern about placemaking and having sort of what's the hook, why would people want to come here, I think that is the uh, qualitative aspect of, of this uh, uh, proposal evaluation process. Who is the team that brings the greatest skill and the greatest track record in crea creating those type of, of spaces? And uh, so I think that is a big part of the deliberations right now, and we're trying to learn everything we can about these proposers and about where, where they've been successful, what their experience is. Um, it's a little bit like the question here, what, what tastes are of what attracts people, that could change over the two years of, of time that the high school is being built. And so in choosing a partner, there will be, need to be some flexibility to allow them to use their creativity and their know-how um, to make changes to the program to change to how the market uh, is, is evolving. Uh, but there are some fundamentals also about what the city wants uh, for amenities, for civic spaces um, that we think will be generators, make us want to be there. That's really important to us as well. And so when we, uh, you know, as we're going through the uh, the next several months, we expect a lot of input and a lot of engagement on that question. Uh, yes? When can we expect an announcement of the recommended uh, choice by the committee? Um, we're working real hard for, um, for that to occur in November, and as soon as we have that on the agenda and have a date for that, we're going to uh, let everybody know. Not October. Um, I think November is the realistic time frame, yeah. This is, um, this is outside of the 10 acres, so if you're referring to this space, space. yes, and that's part of the Gilbane uh, plan, but I think it's, it's one that the school board found to be very attractive uh, about having, making sure there's space in front of the high school as a gathering place, as a civic place, and a place where also we can sort of step back and just appreciate, uh, which I think will be a very architecturally pleasing uh, front facade for the high school. Yes. Is, uh, how will our students get into that open space that, uh, that they're building that would be across the, the uh, grass extension area? Um, so the question is, how will students engage in this in the public space that's that's um, located in for the Rushmark proposal? And this will be, I think this this view of it is probably doesn't illustrate it quite as well as just a, a plain top-down one, but there is access through this um, street and through this street where, uh, where students would be able to access that site. Um, the, uh, the interface between the two proposals in the school is a really important program and design uh, part of the evaluation. It's been a big part of our discussion with them. Um, and an effort to refine that to make sure it reflects what the school board's intent is and the community's intent is about having this site really work well uh, with the school. Yes. So, um, and again, this view, we're taking this in terms of what they provided us in their executive summary, so we didn't actually get to choose which view to show. Um, but that space that's shown, and I'm sorry, um, in this one, it exists in the Rushmark proposal in the same dimensions. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are also schematic. I mean, yes. we've seen things like this, and then it gets changed. So that's right. Um, and so the interim agreement. It will not set this in stone. Right, right. We anticipate right. that this is going to be a public process with boards and commissions in the public where we will refine their land use application. Um, the thing that we'll need to keep in mind as we're doing that, though, is that it, you know, as we refine it, if it has an impact on value, then that will be part of that discussion as well. Um, um, 
but you know, the, the several month process of evaluating the, the uh, land use case will allow for that. Yes. So the question is is about how, you know, th this space, whether Freshmark or EYA, how this space is programmed in ways that actually further our educational mission uh, with our high school, but also with the universities. I think that's a very fertile area of future discussion. In the city's RFP, we simply s stated we want those opportunities. We did not prescribe what those opportunities necessarily had to be. And I think the school board worked very hard to make sure that its programmatic needs are met on its campus. And they don't have to be met over here. But there are great opportunities where we could um, have additional opportunities that we can't do right now. And, and um, so I, th you know, we, we have to further explore what those could be. Um, but I think those opportunities do exist. Yes. So the question relates to when can we start to see coordination between the, the planning for the 10 acres and the school transportation needs, pick up and drop off for students, uh, bus traffic, et cetera. Um, so one, in the, the school's feasibility study, there was already thinking about that um, to lay out really what the, the school's needs are. Um, the opportunity, though, as soon as that decision is made on the top-ranked respondent, uh, we're real eager to now then bring them into the design team uh, to get this school transportation plan right. And um, so there are plenty of details to be worked out of how their traffic is going to work, when their main busy times are going to be, when the school's bu main busy times are going to be, uh, how that all will work together. Uh, so basically from November, when, once that selection is made from that point forward. It does, yeah. I, I can say the schools are anxious for us to make that selection so that that can begin. You may want to mention this also on the CCC. Absolutely. Yeah, so we have the Campus Coordinating Committee, which is tries to bring all the disciplines and all the concerns um, sort of in the interface areas together so they can be worked out together and it is on our monthly agenda to, to work those out. And the, we also have a staff uh, driven infrastructure uh, coordinating committee that meets bi-weekly to work through you know sanitary sewer, stormwater, traffic um, and you know a whole host of, of those issues as well and when they come into sort of the big policy questions we bring them to the, the campus coordinating committee. Yes. Yes. 
So the question is uh, working with our neighbors. Um, as we go through um, our, you know, for the schools, for their site plan process, and for the 10 acre economic development piece, for their entitlement process, and then ultimately for their site plan, we anticipate that to be a very, we anticipate the neighbors will be very involved in that. Um, we will post the notices when all the meetings are, we'll have outreach. Um, that, that's what we would normally do for any kind of a, a land use case, and that will happen here as well. And whether that's true whether they live in Fairfax County or whether they live in the city of Falls Church. Okay. Um, well, we'll stay here just for a minute or two longer um, if there are any follow-up questions. But thank you all for coming out this afternoon, and we'll see you at the next Sunday series. Um, but, uh, but thank you for coming today.